So before I get started with this review of the brand new Spider-Man No Way Home, I want to let you guys know something right here, right now. This will be a spoiler-free review. However, at the end of the review, after I assign the rating for the movie, I will finally spill some spoilers for all of you who are interested. Because the hype for this movie has been absolutely through the stratosphere. So again, I'm going to do the review first, give the grade, then feel free to exit. But if you want to stick around and you want answers to certain questions, feel free to continue watching. So without further ado, here is my review for Spider-Man No Way Home. The movie is once again directed by John Watts, who did the other two previous films, which were Spider-Man Homecoming and Spider-Man Far From Home. And I thought that those were solid Marvel movies. I really didn't love them. I just thought they were solid and just good enough, if that makes any sense. I mean, anybody who knows me, and there's a certain one of you who's probably watching this right now that knows I talk about the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man films ad nauseum, knows that I've always preferred that series over the Andrew Garfield and the Tom Holland series, of course. And I will say... I do like Tom Holland. I think he's fine. I'd like him a little bit better than Garfield. Then again, we were only given two films for Garfield, so what else can you do? You know, he's the middle child of the three. So, I will say... Uh, wow, how do I put this? Um, John Watts did his thing for this movie. Although, I'm going to be completely frank. I've talked about this before with other Marvel films. But it's getting to a point now where a director's style doesn't really matter when it comes to a Marvel movie. Because Marvel is going to have their way no matter what. You know, whenever it comes to making a movie, I've come to realize the producer has the majority of the final say. When I was working on the set of Bloody Bridget, the first AD, which means first assistant director, He's the one that's mostly wrangling all of the crew and calling most of the shots. The actual director is the one who calls action. The first AD works with the crew. The movie's actual director works with the actors. That's how it works. And I have a very strong feeling that... I'm not trying to say Uva Ball could have directed this and it would have been just as good because that's kind of a silly point to make, but my... My larger point is, we've gotten to a point now where these Marvel movies, much like any movie making to begin with, is a business. It is a business first and foremost. Its subcategory might be entertainment, but it is a business. It is about profit. It is about making those dollars, making that money, honey. So, for once, other than Avengers Endgame, they finally did it. They finally got it right with this movie. I thought they did that with Avengers Endgame. I think this one matches that. I don't want to say either one's better than the other, but this movie matches that. I'm not going to bother going into plot details. You know what the movie's about. You've seen the trailer. It's the top trailer in the world. What does surprise me more than anything is that this movie was partially shot in 2020, and the majority of it continued into 2021. And this is a huge visual effects heavy film. And it has a gargantuan cast. And I'm frankly a little astonished that they were able to pull off this much in terms of storytelling, editing, visual effects, sound design, all of it. And have it cut, printed, completed and in cinemas today, December 17th, 2021. I mean, Marvel is the name of this comic book company. Marvel is exactly what this film is because it's a Marvel that it got made that fast. Because typically when it comes to a Marvel sequel, it's usually at least two, sometimes three years down the road. 
But the marble machine is like the energy uh, energizer bunny, honey. It just keeps on going and going and going. It's cranking shit out. And they may have cranked out their best film since Avengers Endgame because, wow, was this incredible. There is not a boring scene to be had. I know that I'm always whining and complaining about long movies. I saw Nightmare Alley last night. That was 2.20. This one was 2.30. I don't care that this movie was 150 minutes long. It could have been three hours and 10 minutes long and I wouldn't have cared because everything that happens and transpires is so great. To, to say that the audience went wild for this movie is an understatement. I managed to record just a few audio clips of the audience's reactions at certain points and I'll gladly provide those for you guys just a few audio clips i mean hey if it gets taken down it gets taken down i got no control over that it's just the audio it's not the video i don't know if you know sound from a theater included with audience participation really counts but again that will be uploaded and if it gets taken down and i get a warning it's gone i'm sorry but if it sticks around it sticks around because you guys gotta hear how people reacted to this movie. The adrenaline was so strong, I actually cried. Like my anticipation and seeing certain moments in this movie, it, it sent me into overdrive. Like even my chest was kind of puffing and I was fighting back from sniffling. I couldn't believe some of the stuff that I saw in this movie. And I promise you, I know I always talk about technical stuff, I implore you, see this in IMAX. Do not see it in Dolby Cinema. Do not see it in regular cinema. Don't even see it in 3D, that's a waste anyway. I mean, we're past Avatar. See this in IMAX. If it's an IMAX 3D, that's a bonus, but either one, IMAX. Because this was a film that was shot with a 190 aspect ratio, but it had a intended 235 ratio. So if you see it in Dolby Cinema, or you see it in Standard, or you see it in 3D, vertically, you will be missing 26% of the entire picture. You see it in IMAX, you see it all. Top and bottom, whole thing. And the photography and the visual effects, chef's kiss. Oh my God. I would not be surprised if this got nominated for and won for best visual effects, because again, the fact that they were able to pull off this level of detail, of visual effects, in under a year, I mean, then of course, they could have been working on the VFX for two years and took a break during COVID. Not trying to be a conspiracy theorist or nothing, just saying. The fact that a visual effects heavy like film like this came out is just, it's great. Like I said, the film runs 150 minutes there is not a boring moment to be had. Everybody was on the edge of their seats. People cheered constantly. There were tears shed. If there was a textbook definition of crowd pleaser, that's this movie right here. And I can't say enough. You got to go see it. There's even moments that take place during the Christmas holiday because Christmas is just under two weeks away from us at this point. And... I never thought I would ever see Spider-Man swing in the snow. It's actually quite beautiful. But this is just this is just a crowd pleaser of a movie. It is it is every bit as worth the wait as you could have ever imagined. I mean, were there little things I could have picked apart? Sure, there's a few moments that I will confess I thought were going to be handled a little bit differently and I think they could have been handled a little bit differently, but Nonetheless, I'm not going to let that detract because this was just so good and it has opened up the door just in such a great way and we're just going to see so much more great stuff coming out from this company, I think, from here on out because I I don't know. This was just this was just a great movie. My expectations were past fulfilled and everything else about it it just it's 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 a perfectly made comic book movie. I'm not really much of a comic book fan and I will say I enjoy the comic book 
films that you know you know, films that are based off of comic books but this was just a magical film i i really enjoyed every last little bit of it and there's no other way to give a rating for this other than way too easily a plus i mean all i gotta say is matrix resurrections you guys got some competition I still don't think Matrix is going to make as much money as this is, even though it comes out next week, and I'm going to go see it in IMAX on Christmas Eve. But um, I don't know, man. Matrix has some real stiff competition with this movie because this is the movie that is PG-13, so all the families can go see it. It's released at the right time. It's released a week before, I mean, two weeks before Christmas to drum up the hype, and... The hype train is just going to continue going, and I'm so glad that I avoided spoilers. I tried to see it on December 16th, but I foolishly forgot about the time change because I was in Las Vegas at the time, and I was going to be going here, and the tickets went on sale on Cyber Monday, and I forgot that it was basically at 9 p.m. on Sunday, so I bought it Monday morning at 7.30 in the morning. So basically, that was, you know, a full seven and a half hours after the tickets were available. And I'm lucky that I got a good seat. I'm very lucky. I usually like to sit in G12 at the IMAX theater at AMC. But I luckily got a G11, which is just one seat over. So thank the Lord. And this was a packed house. Every single solitary seat was taken. Even the ones in the very, very front. The wheelchair ones but you know because the anticipation was so high and people wanted to pay such full attention nobody talked during the movie at all no one wanted to miss one letter of dialogue and I really like that this film held that attention again I know that the Marvel movies are basically a product but the fact is it is a business and it is bringing people into the cinema again I mean, you always have to find ways to bring people into the theater. I mean, in the 1950s, they used CinemaScope, which was widescreen with four-channel stereo sound. They used it for the robe. When they made Earthquake, 20 years later, 1974, Universal used bass-heavy subwoofers, and they called it Sensoround. They used it for a couple of their other, their other films in the 70s to get people in. So marketing has to constantly work in some way you always have to have some kind of a gimmick and the gimmick and the thing that sold this movie is the premise of nostalgia and fan service and i'm all for it if it's done right and this was a film that did most everything right and marvel knew what they were doing when they edited these trailers and tv spots and posters and they did very, very well. And again, I'm so happy that I was not spoiled. Because when I went to go see Nightmare Alley last night, I'm walking into that place trying to plug up my ears and do this. I didn't want to hear one thing. I had to stay off social media. I had to stay off of YouTube. Everything. And I'm glad that it wasn't spoiled for me. So speaking of spoilers, I'm about to talk about those. However, once again... This was a fabulous movie, easily one of the greatest Marvel films ever made, regardless of the 90s, the 2000s, whatever. This is sharing that crown with Avengers Endgame, as far as I'm concerned, for now, at this point. And, yeah, definitely go see it. And once again, that rating is an A+. This might be my favorite film of 2021 so far, but wow, just wow. Final grade, A-plus for Spider-Man No Way Home. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Check the bell for notifications. Just the other day, I uploaded six videos, and I'm going to at least do three a week. So stick around, and please... I really need your support, so thanks again, you guys. Now, now that the rating of A-plus has been applied and you've heard all my excitement about this film, that time has come. It's going to talk 
about some spoilers now. So if you don't want to hear any spoilers, and you don't want anything answered for you, because I know the movie's still brand new, it's out today, please exit the video right now. While you're making your decision, I'll take a sip out of my drink. You have five seconds before I get into spoilers. Spoilers in three, two, one. So, the one thing that I always wondered with this whole marketing and gimmicky thing is, will Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield actually show up in this thing? And the answer, yes. Yes, yes they do. And it is not some simple little five minute cameo, no. It is thunderously applauded when they both show up. One little thing I will say I was a little sad about is Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man shows up first. And I guarantee you most everybody thought it was Tobey Maguire. And when he takes his mask off and it's Andrew Garfield, he gets a nice close-up and everybody just... It was deafening. You could just hear you could just hear the inside of people's throats deafening. You could just hear you could just hear the inside of people's throats stretching as they screamed at that moment. Now, when Toby Maguire showed up just a few seconds later, it's kind of a far shot. It's not really close up, but the crowd went just as wild. And it was so great to see all three Spider-Men on the big screen. Everybody went absolutely nuts for it. There was so much callback, so much nostalgia. I mean, I I worked at the movie theater in 2002 when that first Spider-Man came out. I was a teenager in high school. Now I'm 35 years old. Seeing Tobey Maguire way grown up is a little jarring, I'm not gonna lie to you. But, man, I never thought I'd see him back on the big screen again, not after 2007. One of my dear friends knows that I talk about Spider-Man 3 ad nauseum. And I never would have thought I would have ever seen Tobey Maguire show back up on the big screen like that. I never would have thought that would have happened. And it did. And it did not disappoint. It was absolutely incredible. And furthermore, I also was happy to see... Dr. Octopus show back up. That was such a good moment. I mean, Alfred Molina was doing his thing. The CGI still held up well. His dialogue, everything. None, none of it, it felt like putting on an old glove watching him. Now, my one critique, well, one of many, who the hell am I kidding? I was not a fan of the way they did the Sandman character too much because he felt overly powerful at some points and a little bit convenient and Thomas Hayden Church I'm almost a thousand percent sure did not physically shoot any scenes for the film we see three glimpses of him and one of them he's looking at his hand it is the exact same shot lifted from Spider-Man 3 when he lands in water and he's looking at his hand come apart it's the same shot just inserted into this scene with him being cured. The majority of the time that we see, Do uh, I'm sorry, Sandman, he's always in his sand form. That was a little annoying. I wanted to see actual Flint Marco, you know, Thomas Hayden Church. And I mean, it's still cool that we got to see him even though it was repurposed footage from the other film. But at the same time, it would have been nice to at least see the man himself. But again, splitting hairs here. But we get so much footage and so much of a recap and a how have things been going with Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield and just seeing the three of them pose on top of the bronze Statue of Liberty and seeing them joke and have banter and stuff. 
I really pray that we get to see more of them further down the road as these movies keep getting made because if not, I'll be pretty sad because this was great. This was really, really, really great, this reunion. I loved every bit of it. The audience, I mean, the energy, that feeling, just seeing them all and they were all doing their thing and they were meeting up with the old villains. I mean, everything was just so great. Are there a lot of things that are predictable and unrealistic and convenient? Fuck yes there is. It's a comic book movie. What do you want? You got a guy who's made out of sand, a guy who calls himself the Green Goblin, and you've got a man who's made out of electricity. But what do you want? Speaking of, Jamie Foxx is... <laughs> this might, I'm sorry if this bothers some of you, but you're talking to a gay man. It's a little disappointing that we get a bunch of shots of a naked Jamie Foxx and it's just cut off at the very top of his lower back and anyone who has ever had a crush on Jamie Foxx and has ever seen any given Sunday knows Jamie Foxx has very very nice assets and it's a shame that they're obscured not only by the camera angle and by darkness and he even references how he's butt-ass naked, and I'm like, yes, please, turn around, try to grab your toes, but sadly we didn't get that. Of course we're not, it's a Marvel movie and it's Disney, but at least I have any given Sunday. But he was in such good physical condition in this movie, but I'm done talking about that. But, um, hmm. Overall, it was worth the wait. The scenes with Tobey Maguire, Andrew Garfield, and Tom Holland together it was gold. It was absolutely gold. And you could see like the age progression. You could see the three different personalities. Yet when they're all together, it just works. And the redemption moment that Andrew Garfield got. Oh my God. Everybody lost their mind. And people, the first thing they screamed at was whenever the Matt Murdock cameo happened. That got a big round of applause. The whole movie basically was nothing but applause-worthy moments. And again, seeing all those villains, particularly the ones from the Raimi films, like Green Goblin and Dr. Octopus, were absolutely just treasures. They were, they were morsels. They were just beautiful. I wonder, if, I wonder if they're going to make any merchandise with these newer versions of these characters. I wonder if... The original actors are going to actually get a chance to go on late night TV because of the, you know, spoiler heavy stuff. Who knows? I hope they get the chance because they deserve it. They deserve to get all that credit just as much as Tom Holland does. Wouldn't make sense otherwise. So having said that, I really loved this film. And if you've wondered if it was worth the wait, 100%. If you're wondering if Kirsten Dunst or James Franco, or Paul Giamatti, or Rosemary Harris, who played the original Aunt May, or Topher Grace as Venom. I think I already said that. I'm crazy. And who is one other person? I think I said James Franco already. Forgive me. The cast is so big. Oh, or Emma Stone. None of them are in it. You're not going to get them, unfortunately. But you will get... The original lizard from Amazing Spider-Man, Re-Siphons. Thomas Hayden Church, the voice of Thomas Hayden Church from Spider-Man 3. Jamie Foxx as Electro from Amazing Spider-Man 2. Alfred Molina as Dr. Octopus from Spider-Man 2, regular Spider-Man 2. And, of course, you've got Green Goblin, played by Willem Dafoe from Spider-Man 1. And the three original Spider-Men. And I think that this was one of the best satisfying finales and conclusions and characters put together since that primary battle on Endgame. This totally matches that completely. Anyway, thank you guys so much for listening to my review about Spider-Man No Way Home. It's in theaters today. Go check it out. Take the whole family. Go see it for Christmas. You won't regret it. See it in IMAX. No other way. Anyway. Thank you guys so much again for watching my review and participating with my channel. It means honestly the world to me. 
Be sure to look out for my next review coming up. It's going to be National Champions. And also, Christmas Eve, I'll have my review for Matrix Resurrections as well. And don't forget to stick around through the credits on this movie. There's some good stuff. Thank you guys so much again. You guys take care. And I'll see you at the movies.